Uh, welcome everyone back from the short break. Uh, I am Megan Bear-Merritt. I'm a professor of uh, pediatrics and one of the uh, multi-PIs of the CTSI. Um, and wanted to just take a minute to echo uh, David's thanks to uh, Chris for all of his work uh, pulling this together, as well as Elia and Hubert and Nick and Nazreen uh, for all of the many uh, kind of administrative and, and technical parts. Um, and these presentations so far to me, I, I think have been really phenomenal um, and have really, I've been watching the chat, there have been some great conversations. I've been furiously taking notes. Our, our goal uh, is to have these um, slide decks put up on the CTSI website for folks who are wondering. Um, I think just a few important things. Uh, I think this is incredibly important. Um, it's at least my hope that this is not a, a one-time event, but that really uh, helps to foster a continuous conversation on this incredibly important topic. Um, it, and as I was beginning to uh, think about the day and the talks, um, I went back to, I think, what probably most people on this call uh, know, uh, the quote by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, which was that of all forms of inequality, injustice, and healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Um, and I did a little bit of digging actually about that quote, and it turns out uh, that was part of a press conference that Dr. King delivered um, as uh, just prior to a speech at the second convention of the Medical Committee for Human Rights. Um, and it's actually not uh, the full or the complete quote. Uh, the full and complete quote, uh, quote from Dr. King is, we are concerned about the const constant use of federal funds uh, to support the most notorious expression of segregation of all of the forms of injustice and health, uh, of all of the forms of inequality, injustice and health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. Um, so I, I think incredibly important conversations uh, that we've had this morning um, and the real need uh, to think about white supremacy culture, to think about anti-racism uh, in our healthcare uh, and in our research. Um, and so with that, um, we are moving on to the uh, participant recruitment uh, and data acquisition uh, part of the uh, morning. Uh, just a uh, note to our speakers, we have five speakers in this session. Um, being uh, on Zoom makes it impossible to hold up those uh, warning 15 minute signs. So I will ask you guys, I think the questions have been uh, really important uh, to please do some self monitoring of uh, time. Uh, these are 15 minute talks ideally with five minutes uh, for questions. Um, our first talk, which is entitled Race, um, a complex variable that requires careful use uh, in research uh, will be delivered uh, by Dr. Iwanides. Uh, Dr. Iwanides is the CF uh, Renberg Chair in Disease Prevention. He's a professor of medicine, epidemiology, and public health, as well as biomedical data uh, science and statistics, and then serves as the co-director of the Meta Research uh, Innovation Center at Stanford. Uh, he received his medical degree from the National University of Athens, as well as a Doctor of Science and Biopsychology from the same institution. Uh, Dr. Iwanides uh, then trained at Harvard and Tufts in internal medicine and infectious disease. Uh, he's had many uh, positions across the country, including at NIH and Hopkins and Tufts. Um, among his many accomplishments, he's delivered over 600 uh, invited and honorary lectures and re has received many notable awards. Um, this is perhaps my, my favorite uh, note in his uh, bio, that he has a paper that is entitled, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Uh, and that's been one of the most accessed articles on uh, the Public Library of Science. And, um, a quote that I loved also from his bio was, when contrasted against my uh, vast ignorance, uh, all of these values that we ascribe in research, H, uh, H index, other productivity indices, offer excellent proof that citation metrics can be horribly unreliable. He went on to say, I consider myself uh, privileged to have learned and con to continue to learn from interactions with students and young scientists 
from all over the world, uh, and I love to be constantly reminded that I know next to uh, nothing. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn over uh, turn over the microphone, the platform. Thank you for this very kind invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to, to join uh, this session today. Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, so race and uh, uh, all the problems surrounding race uh, is uh, one of the major challenges that we face, uh, not just in medicine and, and medical research, but also as a society. Uh, racism is uh, one of the major diseases that we have to, to eradicate and the question the question is, uh, uh, is medicine, is medical research uh, doing this uh, or is it unfortunately reinforcing uh, racism in, in various uh, transfigurations? Much of what I will share with you today is based on a viewpoint that I wrote uh, in JAMA recently with uh, Neil Powell from uh, UCSF and uh, Clyde Yancey from uh, Northwestern, trying to think about how we could recalibrate the use of uh, race uh, in the research that we're doing. There is a lot of precedent. This is uh, not a new idea. The, the questioning of uh, uh, whether we're doing more good than harm by using race uh, or by inappropriate la uh, labeling in research, uh, uh, race, ethnicity, and anything that is related to race and ethnicity and health goes back uh, at least a couple of decades. Uh, this is a paper from 1998 by uh, Raghav Pal and uh, uh, Lyme Donaldson, uh, where they looked at all that terminology, that very confusing terminology, um, and they compared uh, what it meant, what it was supposed to mean, what it was assumed to say, how it was uh, misconstrued uh, and misused. Uh, some of that terminology, of course, could convey some uh, information, but there were lots of weaknesses uh, for, for each one of these terms. And uh, basically, uh, there was a commentary along with that paper in the American Journal of Public Health 1998, um, abandoning race as a variable in public health research, an idea whose time has come. Um, race was not abandoned in, in the subsequent 22, 23 years. Uh, if anything, race was uh, widely used uh, uh, and misused uh, in, in various forms. Uh, there were other variant efforts. Uh, uh, this is a, a very nice uh, overview that uh, Jennifer Kelsey and uh, Scarlett Lynn wrote uh, in 2000 in epidemiologic reviews. Uh, they tried to look at what we knew back then and make some suggestions, uh, perhaps to salvage the concept of, uh, of race and try to at least uh, make it a bit more reliable in terms of, uh, of accuracy and in terms of uh, what it could connote and perhaps uh, offer some suggestions on, on how it could be used uh, in, in a positive way. Uh, lots of theories were proposed uh, at that time or even earlier, uh, some of them a bit more successful than others. Uh, this is uh, orthogonal cultural identification theory. Have that two by two table of identification with an ethnic group versus identification with majority group. Um, but basically race and racism uh, really come uh, together. Uh, the differences observed in research studies between races may result from the multifarious consequences of long entrenched and continuously transformed racism and even more so in, in the last year as the COVID-19 crisis has revealed, long-standing effects of, of racism have tremendous effects on the propagation of inequalities and injustice at all levels, including health and, and health care. Races tragically remains a chronic and acute problem of modern societies and, and the use of race in medical research and practice is now being banished as a surrogate for, for racism. And I think that we have a moral imperative to do something about it uh, pretty soon. There's two schools of thought, uh, basically. One school of thought says, uh, maybe we can improve the situation. And uh, over the last 20 years, there has been a series of initiatives. Uh, many of them are centered around self-identification. So instead of imposing race, we just try to get uh, the most information on how people feel about themselves. Uh, there have been improvements, uh, especially for clinical trials and for registries. There's some standardization that has uh, been promoted. Uh, some of the classification systems have become very uh, complex nevertheless and uh, not necessarily compatible with each other. Also, uh, there is improvement in specifications of requirements for publicly funded research. Uh, you know, funding agencies, NIH and others have tried to uh, push uh, to help uh, diminish these inequalities and, and uh, 
uh, vague information. Modest progress uh, also is happening in ensuring that more attention is given towards obtaining more data on minorities, which is a good thing because if you just uh, abandon uh, race and as a variable, uh, there is a risk that we might be studying less the problems that affect minorities and this might be making inequalities worse. There's a prolific literature. If, if you just uh, look at race or ethnicity in PubMed, uh, there's over half a million items. Even if you use more focused items like African-American or Hispanic or, or, or Latino, you would, you would get 45,000 and 62,000 items in that plain search. And, and these are not really highly sensitive searches. So, so we're talking about a literature that has affected probably uh, easily upward of a million uh, papers in, uh, in the medical uh, research world. Also, we have to acknowledge that many researchers on race are inspired to diminish inequalities and injustices. They study race specifically because they want to find tools to diminish inequalities and injustices. And, and all of that work needs to continue, of course. So we should not really throw the, the, the baby out with, uh, with the bathwater. However, in, in most applications, uh, race has not been a very informative uh, variable. This is a paper that we published last year where we looked across Cochrane uh, intervention reviews. The Cochrane Library is the most comprehensive library of uh, systematic reviews on, on medical interventions. And uh, we tried to see how often do people say that they're going to run race and or ethnicity subgroup analysis in their protocols, uh, and how often do they deliver on that uh, uh, protocol promise. So we we took a thousand uh, randomly selected uh, reviews. So we this is a thousand topics of medical research on, on medical interventions. And uh, we tried to see how often did people say that uh, they will conduct race or ethnicity subgroup analysis. We found only 14 out of a thousand that were planning to do that. Even worse, only one of them actually had conducted uh, these race or ethnicity subgroup analysis and uh, uh, even that one uh, did not really deliver something that was very useful. Uh, so the, the majority of these 14 were just dropped because of uh, insufficient uh, data and even that one that was done did not really yield much useful information. Now this is not the entire medical literature but it's, it's a very large and random segment of uh, medical interventions. So the second school of thought goes back to that idea of just abandoning race, you know, just a thing of race as a painful historical relic and uh, a lost cause. Uh, it's not salvageable and all efforts should be diverted towards finding variables that are more robust and informative, both for the biological constructs, for example, genetic ancestry and the sociological, for example, discrimination, deprivation, socioeconomic status constructs for which race has failed to provide useful reproducible insights. Uh, in some cases, uh, the advent of biology, in, in particular uh, genetics, has helped us understand even better that, that race is really a misconstrued construct, that there's very little basis for it. But uh, the, the hope that this revolution of genetics and genomics uh, would help us uh, move to the next stage has not really materialized. In, in some aspects, it has even made things worse. For example, these are data from a paper in Nature Genetics by Martin and colleagues uh, uh, two years ago, looking at uh, the representation of different populations in genome-wide association studies. There, the machinery informing us about uh, risk uh, related to genetics. And as you see, about 88% uh, of the populations being studied are European, so, uh, or of European ancestry, uh, what, what we call white uh, populations. Uh, there's an underrepresentation of, uh, of minorities. Uh, we know very little about the uh, genetic architecture of risk uh, in all of these populations. Uh, to, to make things worse, uh, many of the, the new omics uh, tests and technology actually may uh, be pretty expensive. Uh, so they, they might only be used uh, by uh, people who uh, can afford them. And that might even create further inequalities. And uh, also, it, this, this whole literature is providing a normative standard that uh, European ancestry, uh, white, is uh, kind of the norm against which other uh, data need to be uh, compared or standardized, which again is misleading and making things worse. 
there's a middle ground probably between improvement and elimination. And uh, this is pretty much what I think we should follow. Uh, it, it's, it's unlikely that uh, uh, race will disappear as a vi variable. And as I said, there is a lot of work that needs to continue uh, using that variable and it could serve useful purposes. We can separate the research corpus into two components. Uh, the past research investigations in which race is already incorporated in our textbooks, in clinical algorithms, in guidelines, in recommendations, and in other evidence which may or may not be applied in practice, and separately, future research that is going to be launched. As far as past research is, is concerned, we have to acknowledge that out of that one million uh, papers, probably the large majority is just pure is non-usable by medical uh, evidence. Uh, and it, it's, it's not just race, uh, anything that is going into the subgroup analysis uh, range uh, we have seen uh, really fits very well the description of uh, uh, why most published research findings are false of, of my 2005 paper. So we have to acknowledge that. Most of that research, it's, it's not to blame anyone. I guess my research is as bad as, as anyone's, if not worse, uh, but it's not really contributing much. Uh, we need to try to salvage what is salvageable and, and what is useful and what is helpful to diminish inequalities. And one option is that expert specialty medical societies and methodologists should jointly systematically re-examine evidence involving race uh, that is already accepted as core knowledge. Uh, in, in some applications, it may continue to be the best variable to capture the influence on, on health. Uh, we have uh, some therapeutics and, and some prognostics uh, uh, for kidney function or for pulmonary function tests. Maybe this is still the best we can do. Uh, in other situations, race variables have become completely obsolete just by looking at when they were collected and what were the circumstances, they are no longer relevant in the current social and biological science landscape. Some race variables may continue to offer incremental useful information, uh, including the further elucidation of health disparities, for example. However, other better variables, even in these cases, should be developed to replace race per se, because obviously race is a surrogate of all of these disparities. Finally, for, for future research, we have a, a better opportunity and probably uh, we can do things better if we think carefully ahead of time for any new research project that is being launched to follow these four principles. First, we need to execute a systematic review of what has been done. Uh, race may have been exhausted as a tool. Maybe it's futile to study it again. Uh, or maybe th there is something that might offer us insight on how to do a new study that may best leverage past work or create novel hypothesis based on what we have learned in the past. Second principle, uh, we have to consider collateral explanatory biological and sociological variables that are appropriate to include within the same investigation and, and how standardization, accuracy, and relevance may be enhanced in explaining race-based uh, signals. Uh, so we have opportunities to think very carefully about what else do we want to learn so that uh, maybe we don't need race at all at the end of the day and we have measured what needs to be measured Many of these other variables need better standardization. They need better thinking about uh, how to really yield the, the maximal information out of them. In any comparative analysis, the third principle is that investigators should uh, consider whether white race could, should be the reference standard. This is the default, uh, but we have to think, uh, is, is that necessary? Uh, is that creating some false normative uh, narratives? And, and how can we go about it? And finally, the fourth principle is to carefully consider the potency of any race-related research and gauge a holistic portfolio of clinical and social consequences, including the amelioration of or aggravation of existing inequalities. The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So we have to think if everything goes well and if everything materializes, will we really help to diminish racism? Will we really help to diminish inequalities? Will we really help to diminish uh, disparities? And I, I think that this should be the guiding principle when we, we go after discovering new knowledge or implementing uh, new knowledge. I, I hope I haven't run over time and uh, thank you once again. Oh, I, th I think you're, you're, you're muted, Megan. The muted problem, that was perfect timing, thank you. So I um, wanna open it up to questions if uh, folks could put questions in uh, the chat box and 
Um, maybe while we wait for them uh, to pop up there, I um, thank you. I think this is incredibly helpful. And, and one of the things that was going through uh, my mind is I, I think in clinical care, you know, we talk about evidence-based clinical care. We talk about use of uh, clinical guidelines. And, you know, I think when we dig into those guidelines, uh, many of them are often based on research. You uh, should go back again to your article uh, that that's false. That that is um, grounded in uh, work that was poorly done. That that treated race inappropriately and uh, further perpetuates inequities. And so, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts about where you know as we revisit um, which research is useful and and which is not. Should that be being led, you know, federally by the task force? Is it, you know, our, our clinical associations, should we be as a hospital having uh, groups that are that are really digging back into the research to revisit our, our clinical protocols? Absolutely. I think that we are fueling uh, even future research projects with uh, past knowledge that is very questionable and, and sometimes uh, uh, outright erroneous, so, and and I think that for race, this is uh, a, a very common concern. That's great. Uh, we have a question uh, from Bill Adams. Uh, do you have any experience to share in improving uh, race ethnicity capture in electronic health records and the value of it? There's a lot of literature about this, and uh, some uh, electronic health record systems are, are probably better than others. It, it also depends on how they're set up to capture that information, uh, who is providing that information, whether it's self-identification or, or some other sort of administrative uh, input. Obviously, electronic health records have uh, interesting possibilities, but lots of problems, and you know, just the the amount of data does not uh, save us from the inaccuracy of the recorded information. I think for race and ethnicity, this can be highly inaccurate. Uh, also, most electronic health records are not uh, capturing necessarily, even, even though they have tons of variables, they don't capture that much information on these other sociological and, uh, and health access and uh, circumstances related variables that, that may be very important. They, they're very heavy on, on some medical uh, components, but not so much on, on, the, on sociological and uh, care and uh, uh, behavior uh, components that, uh, that may be very important. And finally, there's a problem with uh, interoperability uh, when someone is trying to compare or, or combine or, or connect uh, different data sets from uh, different electronic health record systems. So uh, maybe it sounded too dismissive. <laughs> I, I don't want to, to sound completely dismissive. Uh, th th there are opportunities there, but uh, uh, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. That's great. Uh, well, thank you so much. I think really important uh, things to consider and, and to think about. Uh, we are going to move uh, to a talk, Diversity and Inclusion in the Framingham uh, Heart Study by Dr. Vasan uh, Ramachandran. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran is a cardiologist uh, with subspecialty training in echocardiography and cardiovascular epidemiology. Uh, he, and he has a long-standing commitment to uh, clinical epidemiologic research. Uh, he serves as chief in the section of preventive medicine and epidemiology in the Department of Medicine and is, and is a professor uh, of medicine and epidemiology at the BU School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran also serves as the PI of the Framingham Heart Study, which he uh, will be talking about, um, as well as the Rural Study, which is Risk Underlying Rural Areas uh, Longitudinal Study. Um, he also serves as the associate editor, editor for circulation, um, as well as the founding editor for uh, circulation cardiovascular genetics. Uh, he is a well-respected and, and trained mentor uh, and is the PI of a T32 uh, training program uh, that is focused on cardiovascular uh, epidemiology. Uh, thank you. I'm going to turn it over. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak over here today. And I think it was, I think Chris Shanahan who emailed me end of December 
asking me that the CTSI was having a symposium on race and research and whether I would give a talk on Framingham. And I wrote back tongue in cheek, surely Chris, you know that Framingham doesn't have a lot of diversity. And Chris wrote back smartly, that exactly is the point. And that's what we want you to talk about. I agreed immediately because I feel pretty strongly that as scientists, we claim the present for our research and we build the future. I think it's equally important for us to take responsibility and acknowledge the past. So I agreed to give this talk. And then I wondered, I wondered, I'm a product of the Framingham family. I'm the fish in the fish bowl that Linda referred to. Could I really be objective about this topic? Could I really indulge in some self-reflection? That brings us to my disclosures. And I'm going to use metaphorically the story of looking at grandma's attic and opening a suitcase and seeing what you'll find. And I wondered whether I could be objectively use my cognitive abilities, or would there be an affective component influenced by the warmth of grandma's hug and the sweetness of her apple pie? I want to make the comment that when one looks at the past through the lens of the present, life and happenings tend to be kaleidoscopic. And especially when one looks at grandma's attic, it's very interesting. There are a lot of objects, a lot of toys, a lot of events, and you turn those pebbles and you find story after story. So is my grandma's story as narrated by me, truly grandma's story? Would my father or mother have something to say about grandma's story? Would grandpa have something to say about grandma's story? Would my grandma's peers have something to say about grandma's story? What I'm telling you over here is that there are a lot of stories. And that brings me to the caveat about my talk, the danger of a single story. So that again is one of my disclosures as we move forward. I'm going to synthesize into a single, single simple narrative, a very complex story of Framingham. And as I prepared for this self-reflection, I asked some of these questions that you see over here. Why are the Framingham cohorts mostly white? Is it limited regional diversity? Is it a lack of resources to recruit non-whites? A lack of interest? Will? Unconscious bias? Could you imagine what would Framingham look like if people of color were better represented? Would there be different recruitment strategies, different surveillance methods, different outcomes? And how could things have been done differently? Would we change the objectives of the study? Would we build greater awareness or greater activism? And that would have helped change things. And when would we have done that? Could it have been done at the very start of the study in 1948? At the time when additional white cohorts were added? At the time of our contract renewals? And then what do we do now? Is it a done deal? These are pre-enrolled cohorts, close cohorts? Is it a historical legacy or is it never too late? Let's dive into some of these questions. And for those of you who are tired of hearing me speak and want to leave, let me summarize the five key points right now and then I'll repeat them towards the end. Point number one, the Framingham cohorts have very limited diversity, very modest number of non-white individuals. The NIH Revitalization Act of 1993, both directly and indirectly, fueled the recruitment of non-white individuals into what we refer to as the Framingham Omni cohorts. Point number three, contrary to popular belief about follow-up rates of people of color, the Framingham Omni cohorts match its whites cohorts in terms of the follow-up rates. Point number four, we as investigators must learn, lead and lean in to ensure diversity. Point number five, I want to quote Tony Morrison. What is left out is as important as that which is there. So 
to shorten my talk and to fit it within 15 minutes, I want to go through four different components. Talk a little bit about the design of the Framingham Heart Study and the component cohorts. That's the visit to Grand Mass Attic. Then step back and look at it from outside. Would the representative of the design at the start and now address this issue about retention of cohorts when people of color are included over time and end by summarizing a few key lessons. So what you see on this slide, when we talk about the Framingham Heart Study, actually there are multiple cohorts. And three of these are transgenerational, predominantly white cohorts. We refer to them sometimes as Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 3, because the Gen 2 are the children of the original cohort and the Gen 3 are the children of the offspring. We also have two omni cohorts that include minority groups. And we'll dive a little bit deeper as to how all this happened over time. So the Framingham Heart Study began in 1948 with the recruitment of nearly 5,200 white men and women under the US Public Health Services. And then in 1949, Truman established the National Heart Institute and the study moved under the auspices of what was then called the National Heart Institute. Fast forward 20 plus years, we recruited a second generation cohort, the children of the original cohort and the spouses of those children. Again, another 5,000 people. And at this point, Boston University became firmly ensconced in the leadership of the study. Then something else happened during this time period. And being Black History Month, I want to take a few moments to acknowledge Daniel Douglas Savage. Dan Savage was well known in the Boston area because he trained in Boston. His internship and medical residency was a founding, one of the founding members of the Association of Black Cardiologists and its second president. Most importantly, he was the clinic director at the Framingham Heart Study. And he began echocardiography and stress tests in the Framingham Heart Study and put Framingham on the map. Interestingly enough, and incidentally, Dr. Savage also recruited 100 men and women from the then town of Framingham and called it the Framingham Minority Study. He was prolific, so he actually published at least a couple of papers I'm aware of on the Framingham Minority Study. So that was in 1982. Going back, in 1995, something else happened. An opportunity presented itself to Framingham investigators to participate in the Sleep Heart Health Study. Now, a couple of things happened before 1995 and 1982. And one of them was the Heckler Report by Margaret Heckler. She was the Health and Human, Secre uh, Human Services Secretary and a big champion of black and minority health. And one of the recommendations of this very important report was recommendation number eight, which emphasized the inclusion of minority groups in the research agenda. Even more prominent was 1993, what we refer to as the National Institute of Health Revitalization Act, sponsored by our own Ted Kennedy, that required or mandated guidelines for the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical research. This is the landmark law that was passed by Congress. Passed by Congress. I just want to share this slide with you. On the left side, you see the six month period from the introduction to the signing by President Bill Clinton then. On the right side, I want to show you what happened in the Senate and in the House, overwhelmingly passed in the Senate. But there were four members who were naysayers, who didn't vote for women and minorities to be included in research. The House was more divided, metaphorically and literally. And I make this point over here that who we send to Congress makes a difference in our ability to include diverse populations in research. One of the important provisions of the NIH Revitalization Act was this provision shown in red in the box that costs alone are not a permissible consideration for determining whether or not to include women and minority groups in research. So getting back to the topic of 1995 and the opportunity of participating in the sleep heart health study, I want to acknowledge my colleague, George O'Connor, and I see George is one of the attendees at the symposium. 
And George had this opportunity both through a UO1, the sleep heart health study, and an RO1 on lung cortisol and longitudinal pulmonary function. And because of the NIH Revitalization Act, you really needed minority groups. So George, through the aegis of an RO1 and a UO1, recruited 500 participants, including tapping into the 100 that Dan Savage had recruited. We were called the Omni Group because they were a mixed group, and I'll show you the characteristics. And the 10% of the total sample of Framingham, the offspring cohort, was a heuristic that was used at that particular point of time. Fast forward 2002, the NHLBI funded a third cohort for Framingham. This time about 4,100 people, again all, all white because the rationale was transgenerational. The children of the offspring cohort, the second generation, the grandchildren of the original cohort. And at that time, my colleague, Emilia Benjamin, wanted to study vascular function in the third generation cohort. And of course, there was the NIH Revitalization Act. So under the aegis of an RO1, Emilia recruited 400 minority groups, and we refer to them as the Omni-2 cohort, again using a 10% heuristic. 10% of 4,000 is about 410. These people were selected from the then city of Framingham and the adjacent seven towns using a non-probabilistic sampling frame. And then the investigators argued strongly for integrating the Omni-1 and Omni-2 into the core contract because it's hard to maintain surveillance and follow-up of cohorts through the aegis of R01 mechanisms. And we were fortunate that the NHLBI agreed. And in 2008, the Omni-1 and Omni-2 cohort were integrated into the Framingham Heart Study. Phil Wolf was the principal investigator then. And since then, we have continued to follow all Framingham cohorts in very similar fashion, as you see over here. The examinations of the Framingham Omni-1 and Omni-2 parallel that of the second generation and the third generation, respectively. And they receive the same examination and the same follow-up and surveillance mechanisms. So what exactly do we mean by the Omni cohorts? And what are the proportion of non-whites in Framingham? If you use the denominator across all the five cohorts that are described, that's about 15,500. You see that less than 5% were African-Americans or Hispanics. If you use a you're more liberal and you use a denominator of uh, 10,000 instead of you eliminate the original cohort because that was 1948, it still is only about 6%. In other words, the diversity of the Framingham cohort lags behind diversity in the United States, in Massachusetts, and even in the city of Framingham, because Framingham is becoming increasingly diverse over time. At the time of recruitment of the second generation, the number of non-white individuals was 20%, and today it is believed to be closer to 40%, as we shall see. So let's step back and look at it from outside. How representative was the design at the start in terms of cardiovascular mortality and morbidity in the country? And what you see over here is the patterns over time and the green line is cardiovascular disease mortality. And the pink line is the stroke mortality. And what you see is the number of Framingham publications that contributed with other cohort studies and clinical trials to lower cardiovascular mortality in the country. You place that on top. And then you look at patterns by race of cardiovascular disease, mortality and morbidity and all cause morbidity and mort mortality. And the red line over here is black, black men. And the green line is women. And you superimpose the gen one, gen two, gen three. And you see clearly a pattern. The mortality of black persons was greater than that of white persons in 1950, 1970, in 2000, all time points for recruitment of Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 3. And yet these cohorts are not diverse. So again, this is just zo zo zooming in on the all-cost mortality and showing you the patterns and also showing you the, cha the changing patterns of Framingham. And you can see that in 1970, when the Gen 2 was recruited, it was about 1.7%. By the time Gen 2 was recruited, it was 20%. And today it's about 40%. 
same thing, zooming in closer, and you see what current data we're waiting for the US 2020 census, but initial data indicate that about 40% of Framingham may be diverse. What about the retention of these cohorts over time? And that's what this slide shows. On the right side, if you focus on the blue box, you see that loss to follow up in Framingham is less than 3% across most of the cohorts. Other than the Omni One cohort, where the loss to follow up is a little bit over 10%, not bad by epidemiological standards, but much worse than the other cohorts. Most of this loss to follow up happened before this cohort was integrated into the core contract of Framingham for surveillance. Federal support matters. And fast forward and what happened after they were integrated. And you can see the comparisons between the white cohorts and the minority groups. And you can see that both the Omni 1 and Omni 2 groups have recent retention data that are on par with that of their non of their white counterparts. So what are the lessons that we have learned over here? We learned that the Framingham cohorts lag behind in their diversity. The size of the Omni cohorts is very modest. Despite that, the follow-up rates of the Omni cohorts parallels that of the white cohorts. And Framingham diversity is increasing even more so that the lag that happens is even worsened over time. Are there lessons that we learn from this? Federal rules and funding for promoting diversity are critical. We heard from our keynote speakers and others, policies, processes, resources captured within the umbrella of structure matter. Investigators must learn, lead, and lean in to promote diversity in clinical research. Intentionality matters. If you're not counted, you are discounted. Errors of omission matter. That's why I quoted Tony Morrison. What is left out is as important as that which is there. So where do we go from here? I want to emphasize that history is not one for the books. History is something we create every day. The first part of this workshop is itself history. A second point, the story of Framingham is not over. The story of Framingham is being written now and will be written in the future by you and us. And what would that history look like? That's a whole topic for discussion, but I want to end with a quote by Tony Morrison. If you find a book you really want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I have, uh, I heard I was ticking uh, loudly, so I've swapped my uh, microphone. I'm getting a thumbs up from Hubert, so I, I think that's better, and it sounds like folks can hear me. Um, and so as we wait uh, for some questions in the chat, and I'm going to have um, my chat, oh, there we go. Uh, I, one uh, comment that I, you know, thank you for, I think, bringing forth, I, I think federal policies are, are really important. It's always both shocking to me, you know, 1993 was less than 30 years ago. That, that's not so much of a distant future uh, where people did not, people sort of expected that it was white men only who would be uh, entered into trials and shocking the vast number of people who did not, who voted against that. Um, so I think important to remind us about that. Uh, Karen Lasser asked, um, what's been the experience of the NIH All of Us Research Program in terms of diversity? I, uh, Basan, you can answer that, and I believe George O'Connor may be on um, as well to address that. Yeah, you know, I will pass this question on to George in case he's able to answer it. It's a very important question, and clearly the goal was to recruit all of us. And maybe, George, you can tell us whether all of us manages to recruit all of us or some of us. I'm not sure whether George. I think that well, is the. I'm the data guy for all of us. Um, oh, great. I can speak Thanks, Bill. George, maybe, in that we were specifically um, recruited to join all of us so that we could um, enrich the representation of the, you know, by the patients that we take care of. And so BMC and two partner community health centers 
um, recruit and contribute data to the system. I don't know about the overall diversity stats, but I know the reason we're part of it is to promote that idea for sure. Yeah, I, Karen, I don't have the latest data on the all of us recruitment rate. I, I believe it was lagging somewhat behind, but the goal was to try to be representative across large swaths of the population, including ensuring diversity. Maybe we'll find out in, in the next couple of years where exactly the program stands. So I apologize, I don't have the exact numbers, Karen. That's okay, thank you. I, I would love to follow up um, to hear a little bit about how, you know, as you guys continue with Framingham and are seeking to have a more diverse sample, um, how you're thinking about it, recruitment, retention, and kind of all of the policies and procedures to ensure that you are increasing diversity, and how have you thought about that? How have you approached it? Thank you, Megan. I mean, that's a great question, and um, I think um, uh, the Framingham family of investigators has been thinking about this for quite some time. Uh, obviously, it came much more into the radar screen in light of recent happenings over the last year, in light of the Black Lives Matter movement and the greater emphasis on diversity. I think we do a few things which already help us, um, not directly, but indirectly. I think one of our research missions um, is to partner with sister studies. The Jackson Heart Study is a sister study. The rural study, which you referred to, it's born out of the Framingham experience. It's like Framingham on wheels, but in the rural South. So, uh, but I think there is a bigger question about, you know, is the Framingham Heart Study called the Framingham Heart Study because it's located in Framingham, Massachusetts with an address over there? Or is it called the Framingham Heart Study because it's truly representative of the city of Framingham? And um, my personal belief and opinion, it's the latter, which means that we need to take a look at how we are going to increase the current sample. Uh, my, again, personal opinion is that closed cohorts uh, can be made open cohorts at different time points. It requires different kinds of support, federal and non-federal funding, and our third generation cohort as a mean uh, age of about 55 years, which gives us ample opportunity of recruiting cohorts that we can follow into the future. Um, there is also the possibility, and we have discussed in, in the past about a fourth generation of Framingham. And the fourth generation of Framingham would be a fourth generation that's representative of the city of Framingham as a whole with all its diversity as it stands today. So there are opportunities. Um, there are discussions about how we would ever fund this because cohort and undertakings are huge undertakings. They are investments into the future, but I think it's an active topic for discussion. That's great. And we um, are running over time, but there are two important questions in the chat. So I may uh, pose them both to you for um, quick responses before we turn over to Dr. Boynt and Jarrett. The first one um, is from Kevin Hartshorn. Uh, are there differences coming out comparing omni populations to mean populations in terms of risk factors? Um, the second one from uh, Kaku Soa Ma, Ar Arma is, um, thank you for the thoughtful presentation and curious uh, whether Framingham actually asks about experiences of racism or other discrimination. Yeah, Kevin, I'll address Kevin's question. It's, it's a great question, you know, um, because of Massachusetts and because of um, the, uh, the middle class nature of the cohorts, the profile of the Omni cohorts mirrors that of the white cohorts, as does the uh, the rates, the burden of high blood pressure is higher in the omni cohorts. So that's one, one important difference. Uh, but by and large, I think the burden of risk fa other risk factors seems to parallel that of the non-white cohorts, as does the um, CVD morbidity and mortality experience. And regarding uh, Keku's you know, um, thoughtful question, we have not so far asked about experiences of racism or discrimination, either of our uh, omni cohorts or of our white cohorts. And it's an important topic. I, I hope we see more um, intentionality in that direction in the years going forward. That's great. Thank you so much. Our next talk is from uh, Dr. Bill Adams, uh, Informatics Tools to Study Health and Healthcare in Boston. Uh, Dr. Adams is an epidemiologist uh, and medical informat informatician. You have to say that 10 times fast. Uh, 
to actually say it correctly, and practicing pediatrician at Boston Medical Center. He's a professor of pediatrics. Uh, he serves as the BU CTSI Director of the Biomedical Informatics Corps and the Director of the Community Health Informatics uh, for the Boston Health Net. Uh, Dr. Adams' research focuses on developing and evaluating information technology-based solutions for improving health and the quality of health care for urban populations, particularly children, and includes EHR-based technologies, patient-centered IT, immunization decision support, predictive analytics, uh, clinical data warehousing, and research uh, data networking. Uh, Dr. Adams. Wow, thank you so much. I am humbled to be speaking with this group, that's for sure. And um, as I heard our great speakers go on, you know, I am, um, my talk is a little bit different. It's gonna be super pragmatic. It's really trying to target things that people on this call could think about doing tomorrow with data. Um, I loved Renee's structural integrity conversation that we're gonna um, grab onto and run with for sure going forward. I don't have a lot of content specifically around race and data, although I touch on it a little bit, but. What I would love from you as listeners is to both ch chat in questions, but also chat in suggestions. So as you hear about these tools that are available to our research community, let me know about ways that you think they could be helpful and that we could expand what we do. We've put a lot of time and effort into building a foundation um, and we really wanna move that forward. And especially at the end, I'll talk, you, talk to you about some of the ideas I have for that. So I start every talk that I give uh, with a reminder that we practice uh, and support health within the city of Boston. And everything I do and our group does is population focused. BMC is the largest safety net provider in New England. Nearly all of our partner community health centers are federally qualified health centers. We have extraordinary electronic health data that goes back to 2000. Um, so we have an over 20 year longitudinal cohort of electronic health data. And as probably many of you know, we currently use Epic the EHR at most of our sites. Uh, the vision of my group around the tools and data that we, we develop is that we want data to be accessible, and but we want to fiercely protect privacy because um, we are gathering quite a bit of data. We're really committed to collecting the broadest array of data that goes beyond the electronic health record in particular. Um, and we want to use tools that help researchers focus on questions more than queries. We recognize that Data analytics is tricky for many researchers, but we feel like there should be tools that help us navigate data in a much more nuanced and effective way ourselves. And then we're really committed to standards because we want the work that we do in Boston to be um, usable across the country and to, to our approaches to be repurposed in other cities around and, and places around the country as well. And advancing health equity is pretty much foundational to everything we do. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about the clinical data warehouse so you all know about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the data sources and tools that we have, how we connect to national networks, and how we're looking to build out the data resources that we have for Boston um, to better support a more nuanced and, and um, insightful collection of data to help us do our research. So I, I think uh, while much of my work doesn't really focus on using the clinical data warehouse other than leveraging the data that they have. Everyone in the community should know about the Clinical Data Warehouse. It has really rich data from the electronic health record. It has legacy data from all the systems that BMC's used in the past. Uh, there are dedicated research analysts eager to help uh, organize and extract data. There's um, a scientific director, Heather, who's super insightful and helpful as people develop their research ideas. Um, and they really are building a, some specialized expertise in, in accountable care analytics and health services research. Um, their model, fee-for-service, is um, sub supporting, self-supporting so that the work that they do um, can scale up. And I really encourage anyone who's interested in using data for our community to reach out to them um, if it fits the, the, the needs of your project. And there's an online, um, this is where my hat as the CTSI informatics person and promoting connectivity comes in and I just want to let everyone know that there's an online form that you can use to put in requests for data and then there's also um, an email that you can email directly so don't hesitate to reach out to that group um, 
if you're trying to build research um, ideas and proposals and, um, and that particular resource fits your needs. Um, I'm gonna talk more about the work that we're doing in trying to build a population-based data system for Boston. Um, and we build, our, our platform is, is based on the I2B2 framework, which is, um, I won't get too much into the informatics weeds in this talk, but I think recognizing that Mass General created a platform that is um, shared nationally and uh, uses open source software um, that basically allows sites to create de-identified clinical data repositories to link that data to standard vocabulary. So the same question can be asked across the country. And then some analytic tools um, that actually have been advanced on more recently by other groups. But, um, the, but that foundation is, is basically uh, how we organize our data at BMC. And we've been doing this for now over a decade. And just to show you how we bring in data from the community, um, we Use data. We integrate data from Boston Medical Center in all of our community health centers. We spend a lot of time organizing it, linking data for an individual across the whole system, cleaning up the data, linking it to standard codes, and then putting it into a really simple data framework that can then be accessed through a web browser or shared with this group called Trinetics, which I'll talk about in a second. More recently, we've added a lot of rich data from the flow sheets that we use in our um, clinical systems, in particular, the social determinants screening forms uh, that are used at BMC that assess um, the, the social determinants needs on a patient by patient level are available in our system too. And so we're starting to build out a more complex and nuanced patient level representation of data. And when I think of all the resources that we have available within our research community, the BMC, BUMC um, community, it really boils down to rich data in the clinical data warehouse, expert faculty and analysts who can help interpret that data, uh, a number of local tools, uh, web browsers, which I'll show you in a second that can let you explore data, extracts that you can request um, to use yourself, expert uh, self-service analytics, we even have some, a few examples of uh, dedicated servers that allow us to um, apply uh, predictive analytics and machine learning um, to using this de-identified data set. And we're exploring new frameworks that will help us be much more effective in, our, in using our data for health services research. These are the core data elements that we have in um, I2B2. And then these are the national networks that we connect with too, the, the accrual to clinical trials network, which I'll tell you a little bit about um, we do share data with all of us, the Precision Medicine Initiative that you heard earlier. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about Trinetics because that's a tool you could all start using tomorrow if you have a BMC username and password. Um, and then a little bit about the National COVID, COVID Cohort Collaborative. And all of these activities um, are, are designed to both allow us rich data locally for research, but also to help represent our patients in national collaborations that seek to um, better understand health and healthcare. So just a, a really quick of Trinetics because it's a very exciting tool that I think could substantially raise the data literacy uh, level in our community and also um, get folks uh, exploring our data much more effectively. Um, Trinetics is a tool that allows um, us to share our data centrally in the cloud and allows pharmaceutical companies to invite us to participate in sponsored trials. Um, as a byproduct of that, we also get a whole bunch of analytic tools. So in this particular um, slide, you can see that we are, we are invited to participate in trials. So this data sharing actually helps our population be represented in potential collaborations for, for drug trials. Um, and then we also have some nice tools that I'm gonna super quickly show you how you could, you could start using tomorrow, actually. Uh, the, the login is pretty simple. And the idea between, behind Trinetics is that you can create queries that put together features like diagnoses that patients have or lab tests that they've achieved. And you can quickly um, count up the number of patients that meet that criteria. So you could imagine building cohorts of all kinds of patients um, based on social vulnerability, um, demographic features, um, uh, the more that we get to assessing strengths, you could also imply, uh, include strength-based 
variables in your data in your data queries and then you can also specify things that people don't have but the really cool thing that i want to um, show you as well is that you can then begin to explore the data in new ways you can um, understand sort of the demographics of our population at bmc you can appreciate that ethnicity is kind of poorly represented in our data and you can see the distribution of data by age pretty quickly and um, now that we've joined the trinetics network we have the ability to actually use that exact same query to ask um, uh, what are the features of patients nationally in the 49 other healthcare organizations that collaborate with us. So simply redirecting that same query lets us now um, start to study 2.7 million patients um, and scale up the scope and the distribution of patients that we could actually evaluate. Um, the other thing that Trinetics offers um, that could easily be applied to um, using uh, uh, new variables in queries is um, more sophisticated um, cohort-based techniques where we can look at single cohorts and compare how do patients in one cohort experience an outcome over time or um, in what order do patients receive treatments following a diagnosis. We can also start to compare outcomes, um, how do outcomes compare between two cohorts or um, how do patient characteristics um, vary between two cohorts. So um, these tools are now available to all of us. And one of my requests is that we all start to use them more and, and better understand how they can be used for the type of research that we're doing at, at BMC and, and the medical campus in general. So I talked a little bit about Trinetics. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit about the ACT network, which is more about building relationships with other institutions across the country, um, and then a little bit about uh, the, the NC3 collaborative. So um, what, what um, the ACT network does is it takes all of our I2B2 instances and plugs them together through an automated network across the country. So in five minutes, I can create a query like how many patients at BMC have diabetes. I can send that query out to the whole network, which I think right now has 34 or 40 um, institutions. And within five minutes, I can get patient counts from all of those sites. This tool is not so much for health services research, but to maybe identify potential partners, rare diseases, um, unusual phenotypes, or just um, groups of people that you're really interested that are underrepresented in some groups and well represented in other groups that could form the basis for building national collaborations. And with very little work, we're able to repurpose the data that we have to be part of this national network. And any BU or BMC researcher can use this tool. Currently, it's not available as self-service, so you would just have to reach out to us. And more, most recently, we did a, a, an investigation of children with uveitis, and uh, our collaborator was able to identify you know, five or 10 potential collaborating sites, and she reached out to them. Um, and then another resource that we're, we have available to uh, folks within the BU and BMC research community is the National Cohort uh, COVID Cohort Collaborative, where we, again, share our I2B2 data on a national scale uh, with NIH. And this is now available to anyone. Uh, the nice thing about this data system is they've already integrated really rich publicly available data around um, COVID policies that were put in place and when. Um, uh, hopefully, our, our, uh, part, our school of public health will soon be sharing um, county level social determinant data within that framework. And so what they've been able to do targeting COVID is bring together um, a rich, complex set of variables to start looking at COVID-related outcomes as well. And um, anyone is welcome to join that too. Um, again, reach out to us if you're interested. And then just a, a taste of what we're gonna be working on this year is we, you're all probably thinking, well, that's great, but that's just health data. And as Renee pointed out so beautifully, um, health outcomes are so much, uh, are dependent on so many more things. And um, we are very confident as part of the BMC Health Equity Initiative that you're gonna hear about next um, and other things um, that we'll be able to expand our core I2B2 data um, to, to closely link um, a broad variety of social determinant data based on where people live in Boston to bring together the clinical data from BMC with the community health centers and with um, uh, as much public data, data as we can um, 
support around social determinants um, within the coming year to support the research community. So we, we encourage you to reach out to us. You can put in consultation requests anytime uh, through the CTSI website. We have some online tools here um, that deep, do deeper dives into the tools that we have to offer and specifically around Trinetics and some of the tools that are available there. And we would love you to contribute to how we evolve over time and particularly how we advance health equity um, uh, for Boston, because um, we can't do it alone um, and we need your help. So uh, Nicholas is my, my close uh, collaborator and available for um, helping. And I'm also here too, so just email us anytime. Um, I wish that this was not quite as visionary as some of the other speakers who were fabulous, but um, you know, uh, I'm also a carpenter. And so I think a good set of tools uh, to help you get your work done um, is really important. And I really appreciate being allowed to be part of this because um, uh, I believe this is going to help us move forward uh, over the next couple of years. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I think these, these tools and knowing about them and, and the power of the data is really important. Um, there is, I think, actually to that end, a great question about uh, thinking about cross-city collaborations, what I might do if it's okay. Uh, Dr. Adams says, have you put a response um, in the chat? I'm shamelessly trying to get back some of our uh, time to be respectful for everybody's time and make sure that we um, end on time. Um, so I'm hoping uh, actually now uh, I'm going to transition to our last uh, talk in this uh, session, which is BMC's approach to advance racial uh, health equity <clears throat> uh, by Drs. Mendez Escobar and uh, Dr. James. Um, briefly, Dr. James uh, is our Vice President of Mission and Associate Chief Medical Officer of Boston Medical Center. Uh, she's an Associate Professor in Emergency Medicine and Director of the Violence Intervention Advocacy Program at BMC. Uh, Dr. James is a founding member of the National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Advocacy Programs. Um, in 2011, amongst her uh, many uh, sort of episodes or types of national recognition. She was appointed to Attorney General Eric Holder's National Task Force on Children Exposed to Violence. As Vice President of Mission, uh, Dr. James works with caregivers throughout BMC. Additionally, she has primary uh, responsibility for coordinating and maximizing BMC's relationship and strategic alliances with a wide range of local, state, and national organizations, including community agencies, housing advocates, and others uh, that partner with BMC uh, to meet the full spectrum of patients' needs. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mendez Escobar uh, is the Executive Director of Growth and Innovation for Boston Medical Center Health System. Uh, her passion is to right inequities and to improve health care for underserved and high needs populations. As a former associate partner at McKinsey, uh, she helps states, payers, and other organizations serving Medicaid uh, rethink the strategy and transform operations. She's co-founder of McKinsey Center for Societal Benefit through healthcare, which is focused on underinvested areas of healthcare, such as mental health, um, substance use disorder, and other social determinants of health. So thank you. Thank you everyone for the uh, opportunity for us to be here today. Um, I am uh, shamelessly uh, proud of, of all of us and everything I've heard today has been amazing. And so um, just thank you again. I'm just so proud and, and grateful to be a part of, uh, of, our, of our family. And so um, we're going to talk to today a little bit uh, about our, um, our journey into the space of equity and the creation of a center for, um, for um, health equity. I also want to give much credit to our COO, Dr. Alice DeBell, you know, who was instrumental in um, driving this. And um, so uh, I think it's a journey that we're on and, you know, hopefully I'll be able, uh, the, the two of us will be able to, um, you know, explain what that looks like, give you some insight into it and some things to think about in terms of how everyone is going to be uh, 
involved in this. It's going to require that we all become involved in this. Um, so I would say, you know, equity means that everyone has the ability to achieve at their highest levels and greatest desires, that people have the ability to choose their future and choose their forward path unobstructed by tangible and intangible systemic uh, barriers. These, um, I think we are not in presentation mode on this. Okay, there we go. And so, thank you. And so, um, what, four of the things that we are looking at, as you see here on the right, are things that we recognize that these four things here are things that can place the privilege and opportunity to choose your future at risk. And uh, next slide, please. I also want to say that BMC is a place where we see risk all day, every day. But, I, and you know, we, we have always been aware of gaps that people have, and we have been always creative and innovative and developing things to actually fill these gaps that people have. Many of what the programs you see here have, are things that have been uh, disseminated around the country, for example. Um, and, you know, we've always been really strong on policy advocacy and even research. But I will also say until the last year, I'm not exactly sure that we had or were able to have the most keen critical analysis on the root causes of these things. You know, I'm not exactly sure we had, uh, you know, the greatest insight into why those things happen. And I just want to quickly give a perfect example because equity is more than just a commitment to a thing. Ex equity means a change in mindset. So I'll give you a perfect example. As you know, I mean, COVID-19 laid bare the inequities that are, that are actually in plain sight every single day, but it was not, it was invisible to most people, okay, in terms of the root cause. And so an example is, Black and brown people were impacted by uh, COVID-19 more than anyone, anywhere in the country. But let's just take an example here in Boston. But as soon as something came about to actually, uh, uh, you know, address that, like the vaccine, you know, to, to help that population, when the vaccine sites were set up, they were not set up proximal to that population. And even if you were thinking about it from a public health approach, you know, you would think that, if, you are, if equity is really understood well by, by all of us, that would, be, that would not have occurred. So I'm only using that as an example to say that equity is also a mindset. It is an understanding. And so we will have to do something to address the dominant narrative that, that has a present mindset firmly uh, planted. And so I just wanted to uh, make that as a very, very easy example to talk about equity and what it is and, and, and how hard it is to um, uh, orient ourselves in that way. Thank you, Thea. And I think COVID is one example, but what we've realized is that it doesn't stop at COVID. We've looked at a lot of data to understand what is the current status of racial um, health outcomes in Boston? And there are a lot of big gaps. Uh, so here are just a few examples. Um, you're probably familiar with uh, the differences in pregnancy and infant um, mortality outcomes, both for black women and infants, as well as Hispanic families. Um, chronic conditions, much higher prevalence among those populations, including sickle cell disease, which, is, which impacts almost exclusively black neighbors. Um, Oncology, especially when we think about uh, premature oncology deaths, huge gaps there, there infectious diseases, way, well beyond COVID. When you look at the data, we realize that actually all infectious diseases are an area where there are very, very uh, large uh, equity gaps, racial gaps in terms of outcomes. Um, and of course, uh, behavioral health and violence and trauma. So, Part of the reflection that we've been doing over the last year is even though we had been thinking about health equity for decades and uh, Boston Medical Center was addressing at least the piece of this problem 
that is related with social determinants of health, we didn't have an explicit approach to how to better serve uh, patients of different races. Um, and therefore, uh, there are still huge gaps in terms of health outcomes, looking at our patients in different races. So I'll hand it over back to Sia to talk a little bit about the process that we've been going on over the last few months to really rethink how do we take, how do we move from a colorblind approach to this problem to a really a color purposeful approach. And just knowing that this is not a um, BMC only uh, issue to address, that is something that is really important that we do in partnership with all of you. And we know that many others are also starting to elevate the importance of this. So really are grateful to have this conversation and exchange ideas and jointly address this problem. Thanks, Elena. And so the way that this started, as Elena said, you know, it, it, we've been reflecting over the past several months and, you know, we created an intentional pathway to make things not be colorblind, but to look at things through a racial lens. And um, we engaged, uh, I guess, more than 80 different leaders and, and other people throughout our healthcare system formed into six work groups. And um, one of the things we did was the work groups are aligned with, designed to cover every single corner of the healthcare system, like the healthcare plan clinical operations, um, inpatient, outpatient, uh, determinants of health and, and, and community partners, also research, education, advocacy, and even human resources, you know, talent, workplace, and, you know, transforming the entire culture. And so um, these six work groups came up with various different initiatives that they wanted to do going forward. And we met for several months. We had three round tables and the last roundtable sort of uh, distilled the different initiatives we wanted to push forward over the next uh, three to five years. Um, and so um, the way in which we are intending to do this is we are, we want to advance racial health equity, but we want to do it by moving as far upstream as possible, looking at what is the uh, root cause of why we see these these um, these disparities and differences in people, and um, from the perspective of even taking things to doing what we always have done so well, but tweaking it a bit more with aiming to alter outcomes, alter quality of life course trajectory for people, and we want to do this and have it empowered through the lens of equity and what equity means in, in its most core uh, definition. And we wanna do that by intentionally, once again, reconstructing systems uh, to meet patients' goals. And I just wanna say one other thing. W one of the things I'm most proud of is one of the first steps we took in doing this was to look internally, to look at ourselves and to create, you know, we did a lot of data. We created a data pack to look at where there are examples of inequity within our own healthcare system. And, um, and not be afraid to do that. And so that it can give us um, a path forward so that we can you know, see through policies and other different things where we might be inadvertently complicit in driving these inequities. Next slide, please. And so th these are some examples of the enablers that we will use and need to actually achieve these things. I will start at the first bullet as an example. Uh, we have made a commitment to elevating uh, our, our, our members of our health plan and our patients and community voice. One of the things we did was to hire a vice president of community engagement and external affairs. Her name is uh, Petrina Cherry. She has been incredibly, incredibly um, important as we have stood up five community vaccination sites as she connected to um, the community leaders. Now, in this, in our equity plan, we had a goal to uh, for community engagement, but not as one-offs. We wanted to establish long-term ongoing relationships with people in the community. And one of the ways that we have done this with the vaccination sites is operationalize it right away in convening these various different Zoom meetings with community leaders. And you know, the goals have been to listen to them, to learn from them, um, to understand how we can partner uh, you know, to achieve these common goals. And 
we've provided information they might need and given them information that they can disseminate, uh, for example, churches as well, you know, so they uh, ministers can uh, disseminate them to their congregants. And being aware of things like who people trust, who people don't trust. And so um, that is, um, is very, very important. Um, and also building and educating a diverse workforce. And some of this we have been, you know, on a path to do, but again, this is now a systemic, you know, sort of a, a process that we're going through. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we know that this is a really, really large problem that will take a long time for all of us jointly to address. And we also didn't want to get paralyzed by the magnitude of the problem. So these groups that Sia was describing uh, were, were charged with prioritizing some initiative to start working on right now. While in parallel, we learn more, we engage with more people, more partners, more patients, and we will add to this list. But these are some things that we've committed to start working on right now this year. There are two clinical areas where we're um, deep diving more heavily, uh, aiming to truly transform, transform care for Black patients and Hispanic patients, which are pregnancy and COVID-19, as two areas where there are very, very large racial equity and we want to start transforming now. Now, that doesn't mean that we're only going to work with those patients. We, the, the second theme for this year is, I would say, infrastructure. We're working on building all of this infrastructure and core systems and processes that we hope will benefit and help all patients and will help close those racial outcome gaps. So some examples here, so yeah, I was talking about all the infrastructure we're building for deeper and more frequent dialogue with our communities and patients. We're investing uh, in upstream drivers of these inequities uh, with particular focus right now on housing and economic mobility. Uh, Thrive is our technology for uh, understanding the social needs of our patients. And we're just um, wrapping all of this into a structure of uh, portfolio management of these transformations to really ensure that this is embedded in all we do as a system. Um, I think, Thea, you already talked about a little bit of all the different things that we're doing specifically, for example, with COVID, which had to do with um, contributing to having faster testing in areas, in our catchment areas of Boston, where uh, testing was really much lower than in other communities through the Commonwealth. Um, we uh, were able to work on the prioritization protocols early on uh, when they were, um, we were all thinking about prioritization for protocols for ICU and um, uh, ventilators and all of that. that. That seems like a lifetime ago, but it was an important conversation that has actually come back again as we think about vaccine access. And I think it's a great example of how inequities are created very, um, we, unintended really. And um, I think one of my colleagues really put it best when, when states are prioritizing the elderly for vaccine, uh, prioritizing those 75 plus, that's creating an inequity in itself given that a lot of black patients really don't make it to 75 and the life expectancy is much lower for that community. So thinking about all of these protocols in a way that is more um, equitable. And then as Thea was mentioning, um, all the work that we're doing to ensure an equitable distribution of the vaccine. So this is an example of how we, our um, equity work is not a standalone initiative that happens separate from our core work. We really want it to be embedded in everything we do. And this is what we've done with, in the case of COVID. So the last thing that we wanted to share before opening up for uh, questions is our vision for a center for health equity that we hope would, will act as an accelerator for all the health equity work that is happening in our system and our community. Very high level, our vision is really to promote health equity, to close those inequity gaps. Uh, 
the focus will not only be in racial inequities, but also other types of inequities around behavioral health, socioeconomic um, groups with different socioeconomic backgrounds. And really the ult ultimate goal is to close health outcome gaps. And we are doing a review of the data to prioritize and see what are the biggest gaps that we want to address. But we're always keeping in mind that that's the ultimate goal. And we'll do that but through addressing all the known drivers of those inequities that start with socioeconomic, um, social determinants of health, but do not stop there. And as Tia was mentioning, there is a lot of work that needs to be do done within the four walls of healthcare systems to really rebuild that trust in the system. And we're sharing this uh, both in the spirit of feedback and also in case it may be helpful for others of how we're thinking uh, functionally this might work. Um, and for us, again, health equity should be embedded in everything that we do. So the Center for Health Equity is a structure that will one, help support, elevate and manage a portfolio of interventions that really are embedded throughout the systems as well as house um, infrastructure that all of our programs need, starting with social determinants of health programs and infrastructure, community and patient engagement, and very importantly, a research center and, and, and the, the conversation we just had before around data that can support equitable research was a great example of, of what that equity research center would, would do. Thea, do you want to close it? Uh, sure. So um, I want to say that, uh, you know, this, this, this slide here is really an example in my mind of the human nature of well-meaning people. It really, really is. Because the first thing that most people would say about people who don't have things is to give everybody the same thing. You know, let's just make it equal. But that's you know, that's having an assumption that everybody needs the same thing and is starting from the same place. So it doesn't exactly work. And then the middle box is, the, it, 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 is it picture is like, I think that's us, you know, and other well-meaning people. It's like, you give people what they need. You know, you need a box, you need three boxes, you need seven boxes. We'll give you these boxes. I love the way Kate Walsh describes this. You know, we give you all the boxes you need. But when, you know, the ideal is not needing subsidies, you know, being able to actually, uh, you know, be self-sufficient, financially stable, you know, being able to even choose your path forward, um, you know, you know, engage in building wealth, you know, contribute to the economy versus relying on it, you know what I mean? And so that's a narrative about what's possible, that we are on a journey to both study, you know, and learn and understand how this slide right here is so intricately connected to health and health outcomes. You know, the data is clear, you know, people who have lower education and lower income and things like that, they have lower health status, as do their children as mere beneficiaries of their parents' resources. And so we're on a transformative journey. You know, this is like a cultural transformation in how we deliver health care. And the opportunity for us to learn in terms of the research, research is not even out there yet. I mean, it is so exciting. I'm telling you, it's so exciting. I wish some researchers who are well, in these work groups could tell you the kind of things they're thinking of. But anyway, um, we look forward to the collaboration, um, you know, enabling the outcomes to just look different. For, get to a place where we can no longer predict these outcomes based on demographics as it presently stands, okay? And so um, we're excited and hope that we, as Elena said, will have great partnerships and collaboration with all of you here. Um, we know we need all kinds of multi-sector collaborations and partnerships. So, so thank you so much, you know, for the opportunity for us to, to share this time with you to, uh, today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks uh, to you both. I'm always so honored uh, and humbled to be part of this incredible community that I, I think is 
uh, moving together and, and thinking about how to really fundamentally change uh, structures and systems. I think we have time for one question. Uh, so we have one coming through and uh, Dr. James and Dr. Mendez Escobar, if you guys also don't mind uh, looking for questions in the chat uh, after we move to the next presentation. But we have a question, uh, can you share any specific strategies or vision for how uh, you anticipate um, the BMC equity efforts uh, partnering with campus researchers? Yeah, I think that, you know, should be an ongoing uh, where we need to better understand um, what's needed. And Mike Silverstein has been leading a lot of the thinking around that. I don't know if he's on yet, but I think it's, um, there are three types of support. One is infrastructure, um, helping build those data, for example, data uh, systems to ensure that researchers have access to the data that they need. And not only data systems, but infrastructure to help more easily engage with diverse patients for research. So infrastructure is one. Two is just making connections and um, you know connecting dots across the system as we uh, have more visibility and are aware of the priorities of different groups and how they may be um, aligned with health equity goals. And the third one would also be um, partnering for fundraising and working uh, together, joining our forces for raising philanthropic uh, funding or uh, collaborating for, for grant proposals. So those are the big themes uh, that I have in mind. Great, uh, thanks to you both. We really appreciate it. Uh, and we are moving now to our